Hi, I'm Jamie. And I'm Stacey. And this is the Body Smart Podcast. And today we're talking about why cutting the BS is the only way to food freedom. Hello, Stacey Jones. Hello. I always do that. I've actually realized every time I have Terry on, I'm like, hello, Terry. I'm, I say Terry Anderson because, have you seen The Matrix? No. I don't we watch keep, movies yeah, I know, TV we've just gone through this, haven't we? It's just because they always say Mr. Anderson in that film. Uh, okay. Any, anyway, um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very this much. Is this your first podcast? It is my first ever podcast. Okay. Yeah. Well, it'd be good if everyone could get to know you a little bit more and we could introduce yourself. Yeah. So I'm one of the head coaches at Body Smart and um, I was actually the first coach at Body Smart, apart yes, from Jamie. Was. How long ago was so this now? That was 2018. Yeah, I know, it's been a ride. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a ride. Yeah. yeah. So um, along with Jamie and the rest of the coaches, we've kind of worked to build the Body Smart Coaching method to really help women find their own freedom around food and fitness. Um, and I wanted to kind of bring to life how I got to that point yeah. um, and where, today. Where did that start for you? Like where did your health and fitness journey start? So I actually was not a fit fanatic when I, I was younger. I heard this the other day, saying we identified very differently when we were younger. <laughs> yeah, so I was like the smart one. I was always like on the sidelines of my brother's sports games, like reading a book or whatever. Mm. Um, and I wasn't sporty at all. Yeah. And you were saying you were literally- I really felt working. like I was the sporty one and not the smart one. Yeah. yeah so it's a complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, I was like, my husband calls me Hermione. So right. that'll give yeah. you an idea. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so you do watch some films. <laughs> well, I actually haven't seen Harry you Potter. Oh my no, God. No, I'm right. one of those. Okay. Um, so I would literally just sit and read a book and yeah. I didn't really think that sport was for me. And it wasn't until I went on a yoga holiday with my mum and mm. that was like a bit of a- game changer where I realized that my body could do stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I started to become more active um, and also like really tried to tap into that yoga philosophy mm -hmm. um, around like what you're capable of and just really trusting yourself a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time that just became a bigger, bigger part of my life. And I wanted to learn more about the body and ended up studying more um, like strength training and going on to being a PT and nutrition and everything like that. So it's been a journey for myself, but it's kind of come through fruition of wanting to help others. Yeah. And you've also gone through a weight loss journey yourself. Yes. Yeah. So um, we have actually just recorded a video on this. We have. On yeah. YouTube. It's going to be on our YouTube so channel. Yeah. I won't bore you all with the details again, yeah. but you can head over to YouTube. Um, yeah. So I... Over the course of probably like two years, lost around 50 pounds. Yeah. Um, just Which I didn't even recognize you when I saw those previous photos. No, <laughs> I don't even look like me because yeah. my hair's a different color too. Well, that too, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I look completely different. And actually now I look at my face and I'm like, oh, mm. I'm so like puffy because I was just eating crap yeah. um, and like not drinking enough water. And mm -hmm. I just wasn't healthy. Yeah. Um, so I really made huge shifts in terms of like what I was eating and the education that I mentioned before around nutrition really helped, but also just like generally becoming a healthier person, like mm. moving more, drinking more water, um, all the basics that we talk about with our clients. So it's one of those things where I had to kind of go for it the hard way. And I, I did all the things um, that didn't work and got frustrated and thought I was broken and all those things. Um, Which is a super relatable story to a lot of the ladies that we coach and the women that we work with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't remember one client that I've worked with that hasn't had those moments of frustration where they're mm. like, why is this not working? Like I am doing everything. And you really feel like you are and yeah. you're putting so much effort and energy in and you're desperate a mm -hmm. lot of the time. Um, but the, the big thing for me was when I kind of not stopped trying, but started to trust myself more and not constantly looking outside for like the next new thing that was going to be the answer. Um, and that's really what I wanted to talk about today was yeah. about like how cutting the BS with all those things is mm. the key. Yeah. Because it's it's easy to just keep tagging onto the next shiny thing, but you're never going to stick at any of those things. Mm. Um, and if you understand like what you're trying to achieve and you understand like the principles of what's going to get you there, you don't need all that crap. You don't need to Definitely. tie into all the BS. Yeah, and that's uh, today's podcast is why cutting the BS is the only way to food freedom. Um, and, and why do you feel like that is? Like why is cutting the B BS the only way to food freedom? So part of it is 
the actual factual information you need. So you mm. do need to cut the BS. You do need to realize like eating cereal for two meals a day isn't <laughs> actually going to work yeah, yeah. like for the long term. Yeah. Um, so you do need to understand the nutrition and like what your body needs. Mm. And then you can just like declutter your mind from a lot of the crap that it's yeah. been pumped full of over the years. Um, but then like on another level, actually the really big game changer for me was when I first started coaching, mm. Jamie had to coach me <laughs> for a month <laughs> yeah. um, to like just get the hang of like how, how the body smart coach. way yeah, yeah. was. Um, and I remember you being like, hey, what would happen if you actually just had the same calories every day and didn't go crazy at weekends? And I was like, that will never work. <laughs> um, but it was really having to like realize I was making excuses for myself mm -hmm. and I was in the let's start again Monday thing. Um, and actually taking ownership of the weekends and not just being like, well, I have higher calories, so it's fine. I yeah. can just have like six gins and it won't make a difference. <laughs> actually owning all of those decisions and cutting yeah. the BS with myself, that was what was really required to not necessarily change my physique, but to change my mindset mm -hmm. to be way healthier. Yeah. And for it to then not be something that required effort 24 seven. Yeah. And um, I think that's, I don't think we've actually talking about what we mean by cutting the BS a lot of the time, it is cutting the BS with the misinformation that's out yeah. there in the fitness industry. And there's so much misinformation and it's like, who do you know? How, like there's so much, uh, everyone's contradicting each other all the time. And mm -hmm. it is, it's, it's difficult to like mm -hmm. sieve through that and understand like who should I actually be listening to? And that like, that's one big part of it. And then the other big part is very much what you've just been saying, which is like cutting the BS with yourself. Yeah. You know, like, and that's, that's difficult to have because instead of blame and circumstance, or pointing the fingers and blaming everyone else. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's taking ownership for the decisions that you've made on a day-to-day mm -hmm. basis, as difficult as they can be, or at times it's taking ownership for them because that is really how you start to feel a lot more free with the choices that you're making. Yeah. yeah. And it's so much less stressful. Yeah. Because you're not you're not like measuring your decisions against some external list of should I, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. You're like checking it with your own internal barometer of like, is this right for me? And you instantly know. It's like yeah. a gut reaction. Like, is this right or is this yeah. not right? And so it's less stressful. You mm -hmm. know you can trust your choices. Um, and you're not second guessing yourself all the time. Yeah. So it is just so much more freeing. And you feel like you don't spend your entire life focusing on like, what should I be eating? When should I be eating? What's my next meal? Have I done enough steps? Like, it, it, you just yeah. live your life. Yeah. Which, even you say enough for a lot of, I don't know, for a lot of women that we've coached, like it becomes because a diet, you know, a diet technically is the foods that we habitually eat and we're on a diet mm, till the yeah, day we die. Yeah. So you always have to think about food to some degree, but when it just becomes that like all consuming thought process all the time about yeah. whether I'm doing the right thing or the wrong thing, yeah. it does, it, it can quite literally like, it can require a lot of mental headspace all Definitely. the time. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that's one of the really big things that our clients say is they have the capacity to then take on other things in life once they mm. make that shift. Mm -hmm. So it might be a fitness goal as opposed to a weight loss goal, but also a lot of people, a lot of our clients like change jobs, change relationships. Yeah. Like, <laughs> because they lot. suddenly have this space to think, yeah. which isn't taken over by like constantly questioning themselves or looking for the next fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is amazing. It's like you you think you're just gonna be able to lose a little bit of weight or learn strategies mm. to learn, lose a little bit of weight. But then actually what happens is there's so much more mental clarity and yeah. it can it, like change your life in more ways than you can possibly imagine. Yeah. Yeah. One of the one of the things that you've got down here being a, a yoga teacher was you often say I teach yoga philosophy through the medium of food. Yeah. What um <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well if I said I teach yoga philosophy, a lot a lot of people would run a mile because they're like, <laughs> oh here we go. Yeah. Um but actually it's one of the things that I love about our team is like we mm. all have the same vibe and we all have the same message to our clients. And whether anybody is a yogi or not, and I don't think really any of our other coaches yeah. are, um, I remember us having a chat a couple of years ago and me saying like, Jamie, you're actually really yogic. <laughs> and sending you like a little screenshot yeah, yeah. of like all the principles of I think, um, Ashtanga. I, th I think this was because I had my own perception of maybe what yoga is and maybe thought it was a little bit more like softer in its approach. And then, yeah, you sent me that back and I was like, oh, okay, like I, I'm on board with that. Like that's definitely yeah, yeah. how I like to approach a lot of situations. Yeah, because a lot of like the fundamental philosophy, so the yamas and niyamas are the kind of um, self-regulation mm -hmm. skills um, that nothing to do with practicing a handstand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people don't realize. Um, but a lot of them are kind of like self-reflection, self-awareness, mm -hmm. um, gratitude, like acknowledging abundance. Yeah. All of these things, actually, when you really integrate that into your life, it 
it does what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and so teaching people to find those ways to incorporate these thought processes or like mm -hmm. applying that lens to things really helps you shift from constantly questioning yourself, constantly feeling like you're not enough or you haven't eaten enough or you haven't done enough um, to just being a bit more at peace. Yeah. And it's a hard thing to say to someone, oh, we're going to teach you how to be at peace. And nobody would ever really believe that that was possible if you told them, like, these are the things we're going to work on because it sounds so fluffy and woo-woo. Yeah. Um, but actually, when you put it into concrete, like, actions for people to practice doing day in, day mm -hmm. out, it just shifts your way of thinking. Yeah. So When you're giving yourself more compassion, mm -hmm. you're being honest with yourself, which mm -hmm. I think... Um, I think a lot of people start to lose trust with themselves in the sense of like you break the promises that you make to yourself yes. so consistently yes. that the weight of your words, even when you're talking to yourself, start to mean less and less and less. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll get up and do that workout in the morning. Mm -hmm. You genuinely believe you're going to do that? Like, do you have that self-trust? Mm -hmm. um, or do you have your compa that compassion for yourself to, to take those actions? So, yeah, yeah it's, I mean, a lot of them are skills. And I, I think... Yeah. That, I look at this with pretty much everything in life at the moment. And this only really clicked for me like a good couple of years ago. Everything is, is a skill. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is just a case of reps you know, consistently showing up and making sure that you're educating yourself about things that are going to allow you to keep taking those next steps. And, and you can, it doesn't mean you'll be absolutely, you've got to have that self-awareness, which is a part of this yes. too, yes. to know like how talented you are and how good you are. Um, I really feel like I've just had to, have some uh, humble pie the last couple of days of watching you because you've just come and shot a bunch of videos and made it look so effortless. And Sai's over there with a big smile on his face because he knows <laughs> just how much I struggle with this. And I've been doing this for years and you've just come in and just like done it, you know, m in my opinion, much, much better than me, which is, which is fantastic. But again, that would be not judging myself too much, but also understanding like, yeah, like maybe that's something that's easier for you. Mm -hmm. And I've had to put a lot of reps in to get to where I'm at. But it, it, it's the same principle across the board with, with anything. And even the things that you've just mentioned here about becoming more self-aware, having maybe more compassion and being mm -hmm. more mindful with certain situations. They are just skills with yeah. enough repetition yeah. and time you can become really good at. And it can actually become to, to a degree, very like effortless and easy, yes. which is a place I don't think people believe exists. No, especially the compassion one. And even I'm still a bit like, I get a bit, ooh, when people say you need to be more self-compassionate, um, particularly like around having my son, I mm. like really struggled with my mental health. And that was one of the things that um, the counselor said, you know, we're gonna practice more self-compassion. And I was like, I am self-compassionate. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, look yeah. at what I do, what are you talking about? <laughs> but she called me out on yeah. it. Um, and I still have a bit of like a wall up with that concept mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people think, well, that's gonna make me like make excuses for myself mm. or it's gonna mean I'm not gonna push myself. Yeah. But actually when you bring in like the integrity or the self-honesty, mm. you can apply compassion in a way that also allows you to be your best. Yeah. So um, one of the things I think a lot of clients are shocked at is that we're not gonna be like, you have to work out five times a week, you have to do 20,000 steps, mm. you have to push yourself really hard actually what we try and teach clients to do is like figure out where is that happy medium yeah. and that requires being compassionate to what you actually need and not just being like well the harder i work the better it's going to be because yeah. that's not actually true it's not true like if you change too much too fast people stick at it for a couple of weeks and mm -hmm. there's lots of evidence to back up that mm -hmm. people just revert back like it, it's actually almost like a, uh, a threat like mm -hmm. there's almost like yes. a lot of yeah. signals going off to say like there's too much happening too fast like danger 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 and we end up reverting back to what yes. we know versus if you actually just start to slowly make changes over time or so slowly develop skills they can start to become part of the new habits that you create and ultimately mm -hmm. part of like how you identify and see yourself and your lifestyle, which is really, really important to change your identity yeah. to become a fit and healthy person. But that does not happen, unfortunately, <laughs> overnight. It's, no, it's, it doesn't. It's, it's it a doesn't. process. And that's part of the BS that we have to yeah. sift through as well, because people have had years and years of this story from media sources mm -hmm. or friends or whatever that just do this and it'll and you'll lose weight and it'll be easy and yeah. it's not mm -hmm. and it is hard and you do have to put the reps in yeah um and part of you know accepting this is for the long game but it's then going to lead to it being yeah. easy it's not it's not a shift overnight but if you can accept that that is something you're committed to mm -hmm. that's when people really see results 
I, and you said that they're like the long game. And I think a lot of people forget, like, just even just reverting back to what I said a little bit earlier, like you are on a diet till the day you die. Yeah. Like the food you, yeah. <laughs> like quite literally. So the long yeah. game is is life. Yeah. If you spend, and like you just put it into context, if you spent two or three years developing all the necessary skills to never stress about food again mm -hmm. and be really mindful and be really self-aware, and then that pays you dividends for the rest of your life. Yeah. It's a pretty good return on investment for your time. Definitely. Yeah. And it's really um, poignant at the moment for me because my life has turned upside down in the last mm -hmm. year because I've had yeah. a baby and my diet is not what my diet was. Yeah. But the principles are still the same and like the ethos is still the same in like how I approach food. Mm -hmm. And like I still eat mindfully and I still listen to what my body needs those skills don't go away. You can't unlearn them. Yeah. Like your surroundings might change and your demands of your life and your practicalities might change. But once you have those skills and you can just really listen to what you need, mm -hmm. you're set. Like, yeah. it's easy. Well, definitely. I think that's, I find that anytime I actually get like extremely busy or mm -hmm. like quite stressed, mm -hmm. I just like default to like my habits, like my default habits around yeah. like food and fitness. And it just becomes like, I've become very regimented because mm -hmm. I have to be to make time for how busy I've become. But yet I don't just like start going cr crazy with food and everywhere else. It's just like, oh no, I just default back to like, like I know what works. And mm -hmm. like you said, you don't forget those skills that you've learned to get there. A good question I've, I've got for you here is like, how do you practically coach someone to start to develop these skills? Yeah. Cause I think that's what a lot of people want to know. Like how do yeah. they start to develop these skills? So a big part um, that we, start with clients is to even just as basic as noticing how hungry you are mm -hmm. because a lot of the time we reach for food because it's lunchtime or it's yeah. there or oh we're not when it's friday we always get a takeout so we're just going to get a takeout mm -hmm. so it's habitual or it's prompted by external factors yeah um, so one of the things we use is uh, we call the hunger rainbow. Well, I call it the hunger it rainbow. Is, no, we've done that. We are, I actually <laughs> found this because we had a hunger scale infographic. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I'm sure we called it the hung hunger rainbow. Yeah, because it's I'm, prettier. Yeah. And I, was, and I, I know that then Kelly actually sent me a PDF over that we sent to clients and it has got the hunger rainbow. Yeah. And I was like, I knew it. <laughs> I'm not that so much So picture a it. rainbow. So it's basically yeah. like one to 10. Yeah. Um, and we ask clients to really fill in like the full physical experience of what hunger feels like at a one, which mm -hmm. is um it's actually one is how like you're super super hungry yeah you're and 10 is you're super super full yeah um so like you might feel sick you might get the shakes you know like mm. what are those physical sensations but also what thoughts are going through your head um and like what nagging kind of little things happen so filling in one to ten is actually usually really hard for people because they know what one feels like yeah. and they know what 10 like being really stuffed being so they feel coma. sick feels yeah. like <laughs> But actually, there's usually like a bit of a gray area in the middle. Like, when do I actually feel satiated? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like a black hole of like, oh, I don't really know what a seven mm -hmm. is. Yeah. So we get clients to really pay attention to filling out each of those numbers so that they can really fine tune. When do I want to start eating and when do I want to stop eating mm -hmm. and not have to go to the extremes for them to even realize? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's it's quite a skill. And it's something that I found really amazing because my son started eating solids recently. Mm -hmm. He knows. That, yeah, babies <laughs> he, do know. He yeah, knows. yeah. <laughs> he literally like shakes his head and like pushes no more. food away. <laughs> and I'll like try something else. I'm like, what about yogurt? Yeah. And he's like, mm -mm -mm. no. Um, like they know. Yeah, yeah. But we kind of have it trained out of us. I think a lot of parents with the best intentions mm -hmm. are like, oh, well, I wanted to eat a bit more. Like, let's get some biscuits out because I want to eat a bit more. Um, and you kind of get taught to override. And whether mm -hmm. it's because of the way you know your parents would offer you more food mm. or whether it's because you work weird shifts and you have to eat when you get a chance and you just have to get as much in as you can and yeah. then you're back on shift. Um, there are lots of reasons why you learn to tune that out, mm -hmm. but it's one of the skills that if you can really learn what that one to 10 feels like yeah. and use that to help guide, when am I going to eat? How much am I going to eat? What mm. am I going to eat? That can really change everything. So much, yeah. You don't even really have to change what you're eating too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. I definitely found that I used to keep, you know, way back when I was trying to get more in tune with this, I thought I was because of just maybe that, at least how my mum brought me up and I get, kept, kept me quite in tune. She would be like, you know, if you're full, you don't have to eat any more of this. As I go around to my grandparents and they'd be like, you can't have any ice cream unless you finish your plate. You oh, know, there's like yeah. there's people starving around the world. So, you oh, yeah. so I got a lot of that, but my mum was quite good at it. But I used to find that I would finish my meal and it's because I would eat it quite fast. Mm. So I wasn't eating mindfully. But then because I wasn't eating mindfully, I'd finish my meal and I'd still feel hungry. 
Oh yeah, yeah. So then I'd like want more, but then I'd eat more and then like 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, I'd feel stuffed because mm-hmm. I've eaten too much versus that I found that, and you know, sometimes, and it's not good and I wish I could, I wish I could be more mindful and eat, but sometimes I'm in a rush, so I'm eating yeah. fast. Yeah. But instead of just eating more in that situation, I'm like, oh no, if I just wait 20, 30 minutes, I'll, I will feel full. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like my rule there is like, I'll go get a glass of water or make like a cup of tea. Yeah. And then 20, 30 minutes, I'm still hungry. I'll, I'll go and get something to eat. But most of yeah. the time I'm not and that, that fullness sort of uh, kicks in. And that's like a really good example of where you then apply that self-compassion and like knowing and trusting your own body because you don't go, well, no, I've had a meal. I can't possibly still be hungry. Yeah. You go, no, I am. Okay, I'm going to have something else to eat. Yeah. Um, And that's a really big hurdle, I think, for a lot of people Mm -hmm. because they they measure out their portion and they've had their portion and therefore they should be full. Yeah. But that's not how your body works. Like maybe you've been more active today. Maybe Mm -hmm. you're during your period that you do genuinely need to eat more yeah. that's okay like yeah. you don't have to fight it and I think when you let go of the fight and when you trust yourself mm-hmm. that's when it just clicks yeah definitely definitely um have you got any like cues that you have to go off in terms of like well, the, when I get the, hungry the hunger rainbow Ooh, <laughs> I get very hangry <laughs> very yeah. hangry yeah. um yeah I get a little bit shaky I get just like really shitty mm-hmm. um and I get um, a bit like, like I can't focus. I'm, I just move from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. Yeah. Um, so those are like more mental kind of cues. Mm. They kick in a lot before my physical cues actually. Okay. So I can tell more from how I'm thinking and behaving. Right. Whereas I think maybe a lot of people don't realize that and they're waiting for their tummy to rumble or they're mm-hmm. waiting for that feeling in their chest. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to come quite late down the road. Yeah, I think I, I we uh, there's a book called The Comfort Crisis, and Michael Easter talks in that that twenty uh, percent of hunger nowadays is physiological. Mm. So that and and eighty percent of mm. hunger that people uh, experience is uh, psychological. And we've got the uh, acronym uh, Blasted, oh, yeah. you know, which just stands for: uh, Are you bored? Are you lonely? Are you anxious? Are you stressed? Are you tired? Are you emotional? Or are, are you distracted? And they're mm. all very much like psychological cues mm-hmm. around you know are you reaching for hunger because you're genuinely physiologically hungry mm-hmm. or are you working from home and you're a little bit bored from this meeting and yeah. you want to go down to the kitchen yeah. and there's a little snack there or you know is it a friday night and you're all your friends are out with the partners and you're feeling a bit lonely and sad and you're trying to soothe your emotions with food you mm-hmm. know there's so many reasons that we could be turning to food psychologically yeah. instead of physiologically um and again like having that self-awareness to try and understand like is are these actions serving me and, and am, am I even aware that I'm taking these actions and what am I just telling myself I'm yes. hungry yeah. and like that's the next step really is once people know how hunger feels mm. and then they're like but wait I'm, I'm not having the things on that rainbow but mm. I do want food it's like what is causing that yeah um and again coming back to that sort of kind of self-compassion and honesty is do you know what if you are lonely and having like a chocolate bar is going to make you feel better. Mm. Have a chocolate bar. Yeah. Like, if not, you're going to sit there thinking about the chocolate bar, <laughs> having maybe like a diet hot chocolate, but still wanting the chocolate bar, maybe having it as well anyway. Yeah. And then feeling really guilty and yeah. then spiraling. Um, so actually, one of the big things is seeing what you actually need, acknowledging that need and saying, okay, I'm going to make a conscious choice. Like, I do want to have that. So I'm going to have it mm-hmm. and I know what the implications are and I'm going to make peace with that. And that in itself, taking ownership can take a lot of the stress away. And even then you might be like, well, actually, I don't even really want the whole bar. Maybe I'll just have a bite and yeah. that will do the job mm-hmm. um, because you're conscious about what it is that you're trying to fix. Yeah. And maybe you realize you don't even need chocolate, like you need to go for a bath. Mm-hmm. That would be great. But if you have the chocolate and then you've made an intentional choice, you don't then get annoyed yeah. that in the morning, the scale's gone up right? because yeah. you knew you made the decision and you're an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is, is taking personal responsibility for your actions, which I think is, yeah. is really important. It's hard. It can be difficult. You it know is. what I mean? Because you're, you're, you're looking inwards yeah. and you're blaming yourself and you've got to not be too much of a critic in that situation, uh, which I know I can definitely be very guilty of, but like, you, that's reflection in itself. And if you've made the decision that maybe you're not proud of, sitting with that for a minute and reflecting and trying to be like right okay I did feel lonely at that moment in time I did want a chocolate bar I'm okay with that like mm-hmm. that decision's okay to be made however if I keep eating chocolate bars every time I feel lonely that's probably not going to serve my health goals yes. which are also important to yes. me so how can I you know reflect on that 
maybe look for a different outcome. Is there anything else that I can soothe that emotion other mm -hmm. than food? And then take a different action to create a different outcome yeah. so I can value the other parts of my life, like my health. And that's the next step again, is like, if you recognize that it's loneliness and you take that time to self-reflect, mm -hmm. maybe you next Friday, you make plans with your brother or, yeah. you know, you do something. So you don't have to run away from those situations all the time. And mm. you can find other ways to soothe those emotions, like you said, but the more self-aware you are, the more enjoyable your life becomes. Yeah. Because you can start to cultivate a life that actually puts you in the best position in all mm -hmm. occasions. Do you feel like that's a problem that a lot of people maybe don't know what they want or aren't, aren't self-aware? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's really hard. Yeah. I, I remember when um, I did like an intensive yoga stay um, for a month, and I swear it was like a month of therapy. <laughs> and one of the things that... Um, the teacher asked me to do was to like reflect on like all these different emotions and like figure out like how does joy feel yeah. like where do you feel it what situations make you think of joy like if you conjure up a situation and you go through all these emotions and actually half of these emotions I couldn't feel them and okay. I couldn't think of a situation that would make me feel them because again you kind of tune out mm -hmm. a lot of the time if you have been numbing things with food or busyness like yeah. that's a big thing I'm guilty of of just mm -hmm. keeping myself super busy so that I don't think about things or feel things yeah I think that's really common mm -hmm. and if you don't listen to it or you tune it out like how are you supposed to know what to do to apply to make it better yeah 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 so if, you, if so if somebody's listening because I think that this is a, a big thing that gets passed around like how do you start to take the steps to become more self-aware yeah, it's a huge thing. It's, it's a huge thing, yeah, <laughs> because obviously we're talking about self-awareness around food and yeah. you can ask yourself a, an acronym and like, yeah. like blasted, which is good, yeah. you know, like, hmm, I'm going to do that thing again around food. Mm. Can I use the acronym and blasted? And I'm like, and just sit with that for a minute or two before going to the snack cupboard yeah. or, or getting something out the fridge and being like, you know, am I feeling one of these emotions? And is this, has this become a default habit for me or yes. an action for me? And that can start to allow you to become problem aware, which I always say can help you then become solution aware because you... If you're never problem aware, you 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 again not even aware aware that this is an issue. Yeah. It's such a default for you. Yeah, and actually all you're aware is the outcome. Which right. is my trousers are too tight and I don't know why and I hate yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I just keep turning to food and I don't understand why. Yeah. 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 So yeah, using something like that, like actually consciously stopping when mm -hmm. you notice most people who have got a habit like this that they want to break, they know what that habit is. Mm -hmm. They don't know why they're doing it. So it might be every time you find yourself going to that cupboard where you keep the chocolate. Yeah. Um, or every time you find yourself going to the, the snack bar at mm -hmm. work. Um, just having something to break that normal habit loop. Mm -hmm. So I've got clients to just literally put a sticky note on the cupboard door. Just it's being just like a visual blasted. reminder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that makes them go, oh, wait, yeah. And yeah. they might not know the answer, but they at least stop and mm -hmm. think. Um, and another really huge thing I would say is actually writing it down makes a big difference because if you say, oh yeah, I'm going to think about what the reason is whilst I eat my Oreos, <laughs> um, you often don't actually, like yeah. you've said, you've pleased your brain enough that you've thought to do it. Okay, cool. I'll get the, i get the brownie points because I've thought to do the reflection. But you don't actually follow through with really putting yeah. that into concrete terms. Whereas if you write it down, you have to make it into a sentence. Yeah you have to actually get your thoughts together mm. and really be clear on what it is. Yeah. Um, so whether that's in a journal or even just in your notes in your phone, um, it has to be in black and white to really make a difference, mm. I think. And that's, um, oh, actually, Sai, you've told me this. That's a legitimate thing, isn't it? Mm. Where if when people tell their goals or they say their goals, they they feel like they've hit, hit them or they get like a reward from them. Yeah, I think you get a dopamine peak by just telling someone you were reward uh, your goals. Yeah. So you get that without actually hitting your goals. Yeah. So it stops you wanting to actually go for them. Yeah. Yeah, so like if that's what you, like we just said, if you're just there eating your Oreos and it's like, oh, well, yeah, okay, I'll write this down. You're, you're getting like the, the hit of the dopamine of eating the enjoyable food. You're thinking that you're going to do this nice action, but then you don't actually take the action and then the awareness doesn't come and then probably the guilt maybe a, yeah. an hour later kicks in yeah. more because you've not only ate the food, but you told yourself you would do something that you didn't and then also didn't, yeah. didn't do that. When it comes to uh, journaling and writing it down, is, is there anything that you would advise to write down or like a, a formula um, it can to follow? Just, it can literally just be one word to start with because like I said, okay. it can be quite hard to dig into what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. And when we get deeper in coaching, we're going to, we're going to like 
go through the layers. Like this is the word that came to mind when you found yourself at that cupboard door. Yeah. But what was that? What happened like an hour ago that made that like start to bubble up? Mm -hmm. And we really work into um, the process that where maybe two hours ago you could have done something to make yourself feel better yeah. and not have all that build up. But it can just be a word to start with. And the great thing about our brains is you just plant a seed like that. Mm -hmm. Because you weren't aware before, as soon as you've put a word to it, you're like mm -hmm. in the back of your head, your brain's going to start thinking like, oh, why was that? Oh. Yeah, yeah. You're not consciously doing it, but your brain is so powerful. It mm -hmm. will start to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you'll be changing your behavior without even trying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, fantastic. Is there... Is there anything that you do personally, like if stuff like this happens, or do you feel like you've mastered the skill of self awareness and you're kind of yeah? Know I feel like I now? I feel like I don't have to consciously do it anymore. Yeah. But I do remember a time um, it was in COVID actually when we were crazy busy, yeah, yeah, crazy crazy busy, like doing 12, 14 hour days, and I found myself with like the family bag of like mini Snickers. <laughs> And I was going back to the cupboard and back to the cupboard and back to the cupboard. Right. And I was like, I haven't done this for like four years. What's okay. going on? Yeah. And I had to then like consciously stop and be like, okay, what is going on? Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's like recognizing when habits mm -hmm. are coming back. And yeah. like, unfortunately with habits, they can come back. And old habits, yeah, because old habits die hard. Yeah, yeah very much. Um, and especially when you're then in a situation where that habit used to be really functional for you and it used to mm -hmm. really help you out, your brain's gonna be like, ooh, similar situation, that habit was good before, let's do that again. Yeah, yeah. And so when I was really stressed previously, like I would comfort it. Mm -hmm. And so my brain just went, cool. And the way habits work is it's not conscious thought process. So you yeah. don't think, oh, I'm really stressed. I'm going to go and pick out on all the Snickers. Mm -hmm. You just do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's allowing yourself to recognize those things mm -hmm. and then be able to stop and yeah. think and then reinterpret mm -hmm. from that point of, okay, what's going on and what do I want to do instead? Yeah. I, I actually have a, uh, like, this happens to me slightly, well, not slightly, but I, I'm, again, I'm really aware of it, which is if I get really stressed, um, my appetite goes. I'm, oh, like, okay. I'm like completely no appetite yeah. at all. And when this first started happening, I would just be like, oh, I'm not hungry, so I wouldn't eat all day. Because that would just be like, mm. I'm in tune with my body. Like, mm. I'm not hungry. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't what was happening. It was like the stress was just like numbing any mm. hunger that I had. Probably just sitting in like a high level of anxiety if mm -hmm. thinking back on it. Um, and then I would just not eat sometimes or I would eat very, like half the amount I normally would. And if I'd done that for like more than a day, like if I had like this third day, I'd feel like I'd been hit in the face by a bus. Yeah. I'd wake up, I'd be yeah. so tired. My eyelids would feel heavy. I was, cause I've eaten like half the calorie, like I'm in a massive calorie deficit mm -hmm. in essence, while obviously probably burning more calories of the stress yeah. and the anxiety. Yeah. Um, so now I've, I've developed that kind of skill where I'm like, hmm, I normally would eat around this time or I haven't eaten in however long and I don't feel hungry at all. And I will actually go and like force myself to eat, which is mm -hmm. a bit of a strange mm -hmm. concept to go and do. And I actually find once I start eating, it's, it's okay. But there was even some times where I still wouldn't feel hungry. Food would actually be, feel a bit like repulsive. Uh, so I'd start drinking my calories. I'd just blend them. Cause I was yeah. like, at least I can Need get, at least I can get something in, in yeah, terms yeah. of the energy because probably having lower energy and feeling worse and feeling hungry and feeling worse the next day is not going to make the stress go away. It's probably going to make it go yep. higher. So it was just developing a strategy to deal with a, a situation like that, that. That's I'm like, yeah, like it'd be great if I could never be stressed out, but like that's not the reality of life <laughs> either, is it? No. Um, but again, just like probably the other side sometimes of what stress can do. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because we talk a lot because of the nature of our client base of mm. how to reduce emotional eating or, you know, eat less. But actually these skills serve you in so many ways, like you yeah. just said. And mm. I found... Um, like I've just been too busy to eat with mm. having a little baby. I've had the same problem where I've then okay. had to be, instead of like, oh, I'm not hungry, why am I eating? I'm like, I am super hungry, why am I not eating? Yeah, yeah. And like, what is the the trigger that I need to tap into before I get to this like shakes kind of stage? Yeah, yeah. Because I was just tuning out because I was so busy. And um, routines completely changed yeah. with having a baby, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so, once you generate that like level of self-awareness and you know how to tap into it, you can use it for all different situations. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. So a couple of take home points for people then, like if we could give them before, before mm -hmm. we sort of close off, um, self-awareness is yeah. definitely the skill and the key, the key that people yeah. need. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and tips for helping develop more self-awareness, especially around food. Yeah. I mean, I would say literally do your own hunger rainbow, draw yourself a one to yeah, 10. Yeah. 
and it will probably take you a week to populate that out yeah. because like i said you're probably going to have that gray area yeah. where and you if, can't if, oh sorry i was going to say yeah definitely do yeah. that and um if you drop us an email on hello at bodysmartfitness.com, the amazing Kelly Bamble will send you yes. the Hunger Rainbow uh, yes. PDF. So you, so you guys can use that as well. But again, doing your own is fantastic too. Yeah, and yeah. actually some some people's brains work better with like um, pictures or creative Visuals, ways of doing yeah. it. So I've had clients who've like drawn stuff or used colors to mm -hmm. represent like what that feels like. Yeah. Um, so don't feel like it has to be words if that doesn't resonate for you and that doesn't work for how your brain mm -hmm. would put it into action yeah 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 and, and anything else um and then the self-compassion thing like yeah. it is super hard because we are all like goal driven from being at school to when you have to get grades like mm. that is drilled into us outcomes outcomes like productivity mm. but actually stopping and allowing yourself to think like long term is this going to serve me yeah and what would be a way that i could maybe do this in a slightly less intense way mm -hmm. and i'll actually maybe be better long term yeah yeah, definitely. For me, it would be really focusing on becoming problem aware. I feel like it's mm. really, and because that's a part of self awareness. Mm -hmm. So, like using an, an acronym like Blasted, um, and and you said before, you know, stick a, a poster yeah. uh, note on like your fridge, yeah. or if you find like this certain situations, like you've started to identify, like, oh, I'm reaching here too much in work, or I'm doing this, or there's a certain time, or it's a certain day. You know, can you set alarms in your phones? Can you set other cues that can just get you to stop and yeah. think? And if you can, and just give yourself like a minute or two and be like, is this action that I'm going to take serving the, you know, the life that I want to live and the goals that I want to achieve? And if it's not, it doesn't mean that you still can't go and follow through with what you were about to do, whether it's around food, but just if you start to build that muscle of stopping and thinking, like it's going to start to allow you to become more self-aware yeah. and take ownership over the actions that you yeah. are taking. And actually that question is something that a lot of clients have said to me is stuck with them is like, does this serve me? Yeah. And yeah. whether that's in the moment, long term, for my goals, it can mean a bunch of things, but it can be a quick like stop and check. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you very much.